And at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Doug, and he'll walk you through preparing your Stage 500 system for a year-end close. Thanks, Doug. Great. Thanks, Walt. So today we're going to cover uh, two primary topics, what we need to do to close out the current 2016 year, assuming you're on a calendar year, uh, in Sage 500, and then what do we need to do to get ready for 2017. So our agenda is listed on this uh, slide here. We're going to go uh, have a brief touch point on disaster recovery plans. We'll then talk a little bit about doing physical inventory, everybody's favorite topic, 1099s and then uh, purging and or pruning data uh, in 2016 before we then roll into getting ready for 2017 where we'll talk about setting up a new GL calendar, a new inventory calendar, uh, talk a little bit about folks who may be working with Sage fixed assets and uh, doing some house uh, excuse me, housekeeping on user security groups. So disaster recovery plans are kind of a, a passion for me just because I've seen, uh, unfortunately, many clients fall into the trap where they weren't ready for a catastrophic event. So I'm just going to spend a, a minute or two on this topic. Um, the bottom line is to take the mindset that you're preparing for the worst but hoping for the best, and hopefully you wind up landing somewhere in the middle. Uh, for those of you who may not know, a disaster recovery plan or a DRP um, it just gives you some um, logistics to tackle so that uh, if you do run into a catastrophic event, whether that be hurricane, fire, uh, server meltdown, what have you, uh, you have the steps in place to address the situation. So we like to ensure that uh, clients review this plan once a year at least, and that plan should include things like making sure that you have replacement hardware available so that if you do have servers or network switches or PCs that do go down that you've got replacement hardware to, to fill in those gaps. And with these disaster recovery plans, there's no such thing as too much communication. You want to make sure that you've got uh, contact list information that's current for everyone that may have any touch point within the disaster recovery plan. And you want to make sure that you lay out a detailed checklist for what steps need to be taken in the event of a disaster and who's responsible for each of those steps. In terms of SQL specifics that might relate to a disaster recovery plan, you need to know which server recovery model you're using for each of the databases that you may house in your SQL server. There are three primary SQL server recovery models available, simple, full, and bulk log. I won't get into the specifics of what each of those entails. I'll just tell you that I think by default you're going to roll out as simple, which gives you the uh, easiest method of recovery, but also um, may not be the most current. So with simple, you, you are uh, basically relying on a full backup of the database. You have to restore back to a full copy of the database full backup uh, recovery model allows you to also get more granular. Uh, so you may be doing a full backup once a day, but you might be doing transaction log backups throughout the day, and you can then restore back to a point in time earlier in the day rather than having to go all the way back to the previous night or whenever you did the previous full backup. So just know what your recovery model is so that you can then plan for the appropriate steps of how to restore your SQL database should you need to do so. That includes managing whatever the backup media might be, and by backup media I mean are you simply managing the backup files that might be on your network or stored off-site somewhere, or do you have physical backup tapes that need to be uh, shuttled off-site so that if something were to happen at your primary location, those backup tapes are not going to be subject to whatever damage um, may have been the result of the, the disaster. And last but not least, uh, disaster recovery plans are useless unless you test the process. So in terms of SQL specifics, you want to make sure that you're testing your backup and restore process of your database. Don't assume that since the job isn't sending out some sort of alert to let you know that the backup succeeded, or even if you get a confirmation that the backup has succeeded, don't just assume that you're going to be able to restore that without an issue. Test it to make sure that you can restore it to a test database. So be prepared. 
Okay, so let's jump into the 500 specific tasks that we wanted to cover today on closing out the current year. Uh, many companies, many of our clients are either distributors or manufacturers who have inventory to be concerned with, and that's probably their primary asset, if not one of their primary assets. So to go through the fiscal inventory process, you have to go through a handful of steps, and they're laid out within the process physical inventory task in 500 in the order that you need to tackle them. So the first step in the process, once you've created a batch for the warehouse that you're doing the count in, is to select which items you want to count. And if your warehouse is small, you may simply want to select every item in the warehouse. That's perfectly fine. Um, but you may <clears throat> find it more effective to do groups of counts. So you may want to set up a batch based on uh, a certain item type, item status, uh, the zone, if you're using zones within 500 warehouse, uh, the bin locations, item class, and so forth. So you can see on the PowerPoint there are a dozen or so different uh, fields that you can use to filter the selection list of the items that you want to count within any particular batch. Once you've selected those items to count, you have to go through the freeze task, which is a simple click of a button, and that just grabs a snapshot of what the system believes to be the current on-hand quantity for those items. And you can then go ahead and generate your count documents, either count cards, which would have one item bin combination per card, or count sheets, which would typically be an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper with as many items and bin locations if you're tracking by bin on that sheet. So you can pick either the card format or the sheet format. And when you go to print those cards or sheets, you also have the option to print some blank cards or some blank lines on the sheets. And what that allows you to do is it, it facilitates filling in items that you may find when you're actually doing a physical count out in the warehouse space that the system may not have recognized any on-hand quantity for. So you've got a place to fill in those items that you find once you've done that, the folks would actually go out and, and do the physical count, and then they can enter the physical counts in 500, and there are a couple of options within that task. Um, you've got the option of whether or not you want to show the frozen quantity to the user who is keying in the count. There's a risk and reward to, to doing that, right? So if you show the user the frozen count, um, they may simply default to whatever the system has frozen and assume that that's correct and, and not rely on the physical count that was done out in the warehouse. By the same token, if you do not show that frozen quantity uh, and the user enters a number that's way off base, uh, that also may trigger some concern. So you have to decide whether you feel it's appropriate to show the user the frozen quantity uh, or not. You can also, when you're entering the counts, uh, click on a radio button to show either only the items that have already been counted, the items that have not been counted, or all items. In the newer versions of 500, you also have the ability to uh, leverage Data Porter to be able to enter counts that you may have recorded in Excel. So if you've taken your physical count and an end user has pumped that data into an Excel sheet, the newer versions of 500 have a data entry grid that is data porter friendly. Data porter is one of the many data import utilities available for Sage 500, and it allows you to click a button on the physical count screen to launch an Excel sheet with the appropriate fields for the uh, item number, the bin number if you're tracking by bin, and the quantity uh, that you counted. and then Data Porter would actually scrape that data out of the Excel sheet into the appropriate 500 screen for you so that you don't have to sit there and beat the keys to, to enter that information. There's also an option to generate a report of missing count cards. So if you've entered what you believe to be the full physical inventory, you can then run the missing count cards to see which items you had frozen for which you have not yet entered any value for the counted quantity. If you do wish to use that option, then you want to be sure during the process of entering your physical counts that you don't check the box or, or click the button to set uncounted items to zero. 
So as you're doing data entry in the physical count process, if you believe you've entered everything, there is a button that you can click on that says, basically, if I haven't entered a count yet, assume that the count should be zero for that. If you want to be able to run the missing count cards report, you should not select that option. If you don't care about generating those missing count cards, then it is a time saver to simply click that one button and assume that everything else that has been frozen and not entered is a zero count. Once you've gotten that step completed, the next step would be to run your reconciliation report. And that will show you any transactions that may have been posted since the items were frozen. So while you were actually performing your physical count, if there were any shipments or receipts of goods or inventory transactions from process uh, inventory transaction that may have been posted along the way so that you can account for those differences. And then we have the discrepancy report, and that discrepancy report will show you any items where the on-hand quantity variance percent is greater than the value that's stored in maintain inventories tolerance percent field on the main tab. So for each inventory item in a warehouse record, you can define what that acceptable tolerance level is for the count to be off in a percentage. And if the variance that was entered in the count versus what was frozen exceeds that tolerance percent, it would pop up on this discrepancy report. Okay, transitioning into our 1099s. Uh, the good news is that if you are a 1099 miscellaneous filer and you only file paper forms, then there is no change to the IRS form for 2016. So that means that if traditionally in the past you've had to reach out to uh, RKL or you've had to deal with applying a patch or a SAGE update at the end of the year in order to be able to generate your 1099s, um, if you're only 1099, only, uh, excuse me, only 1099 miscellaneous and only paper, you should not need to do that this year. You do have a new option this year that SAGE is offering. They've partnered with a firm called Atrix to allow for e-filing of 1099 forms. And the paper filing for those forms, uh, as I understand it, is actually free. But if you do wish to do electronic filing for those forms, there is a, a range of fees based on the level of service that you want. And I've included a hyperlink here that gives you the additional details for what the pricing is, but it is uh, relatively modest. I think it ranges from about 50 cents per form to about a dollar 50 per form maximum uh, to allow you to do electronic filing for federal and state. So you've got the option to pick the level of service that you might need and bypass the whole printing, stuffing envelopes and other tedium associated with the 1099 process. The functionality for the Atrix solution is going to be pushed out sometime this month as a standalone update that can be applied. So if you do wish to take advantage of that e-filing service through Atrix, then you can reach out to us or, or work with your internal IT team to get that standalone update applied to your system. Uh, if you wish to do so, the prerequisite is that you do have the January 2016 update of your software for either version 2016, 2014, or 2013 already in place before that standalone update would be applied. In addition, uh, Sage typically releases that same update for the 1099s in the following January product updates. This year, they will only be offering that 1099 update in the January product update for 500 versions 2016 and 2014. So if you are on 2013 or earlier, you would not have the ability to use the Atrix solution uh, if you were to lean on that product update that will come out in January. Uh, filing deadline for 1099 forms is January 31st, regardless of whether you're filing on paper or electronically. And just make a note that penalties have increased. So you do want to make sure that you meet the filing deadline so that you don't have to deal with those penalties. 
You also have the option of doing electronic filing via FIRE, which is filing information returns electronically. Uh, it's directly through the IRS, and it's actually required if you have 250 more 1099 forms to be filed. I've listed uh, IRS instructions for the various 1099 forms. Uh, the, the vast majority of our client base runs 1099 miscellaneous forms. That's the first link that's there. If you also happen to be one of the few who is responsible for filing form 1099 interest or 1099 dividend, I've provided those links as well. A couple of uh, tidbits for folks who want to be able to track the 1099 payment activity in 500. There is a task called Edit Voucher 1099 Data that lives in a submenu under the Activities menu for 1099 Processing. And that allows you to select a vendor at a time, and for that vendor, select any voucher that may have been entered. And if you had either inadvertently not recorded that voucher as a 1099 reportable voucher, or you had and you need to change it to a non-reportable voucher, you've got the ability to, to make those changes in the Edit Voucher 1099 data task. There's also an IRS 1099 corrections task that will allow you to make changes to the previously issued 1099 if you've already sent them out. And if you happened to have gone live with your Sage 500 system mid-year and made some payments that were 1099 reportable prior to your conversion to 500 and that data did not get captured during the migration to 500, you do have the ability to go back into the 1099 beginning balances task and enter the appropriate amounts that were paid outside of 500 earlier in the year. Or if for some reason you failed to record a vendor as 1099 reportable rather than manually editing each of the respective vouchers, you could simply go back in and edit the beginning balance. Our recommendation would be if you've got the vouchers recorded in 500, use the Edit Voucher 1099 data task to correct those. But if you have not, uh, excuse me, if you have payments that were made outside of 500, use the 1099 beginning balances task to capture those payment amounts. There are a couple of explore views that are available to get some, but not necessarily all, of your 1099 data. So you do have an explore vendors and explore vendor payments, business insights explore views. But each of them is missing pieces of the puzzle, if you will. So in the case of Explore Vendors, it doesn't track the last payment date, uh, and it does not track a 1099 type field. The Explore Vendor Payments does not have any 1099 data in it, unfortunately. So if you want to rely on a BIE view to validate the data that you have in your system, you can certainly reach out to us. Uh, we have several clients that we've provided custom Explore tasks that kind of glue together all of the data for 1099 payments to make it uh, easier for you to have one-stop shopping, a single view to look at, and look at up to three years' worth of payment history so that you can see those changes over time if that's meaningful for you. So if that's something of interest to you, please feel free to reach out to either your account rep or the consultant that you normally work with, or feel free to shoot me an email and we'll get you squared away. Last but not least, you can uh, print or generate the 1099s from the Accounts Payable Insights folder. Underneath the Reports subfolder, you'll find a 1099 Reports menu, and that is where you'll find the task to print those pre-printed forms or file electronically if you're using the non-Atrix version that we mentioned earlier. Um, I believe that the screen will simply be modified if you do download the Atrix solution um, so it will be the same place that you would go to to file electronically regardless of whether you're using Atrix or the native Sage 500 task. And as I mentioned earlier, you should have those Sage uh, standalone updates in December, and then they should be included in the product updates in January. Last but not least, if this is all a little cumbersome for you, then you do have an option. Um, if you pay your 1099 vendors by credit card, then you are not responsible to report those 1099 payments because the credit card companies themselves are responsible for filing that payment on Form 1099-K, which is the payment card and third-party network transaction. 
So if you want to alleviate the burden altogether, start paying your 1099 vendors by credit card. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about purging. Um, you may have heard war stories about uh, folks who have tried to purge data and either found that the purge ran for hours or maybe a day and didn't actually do anything, or you may have heard that folks have tried to purge data and then found inconsistencies in the data that's left over. Both of those war stories are true. Uh, for that reason, we generally don't recommend you using the native Sage purge utilities, although they have revised the inventory purge lately and it is uh, safer and more effective, but it does still have some gaps. So <clears throat> I would start the process by checking first to see if you have any old pending batches in each module. Uh, within each module, you have a post batches task. So in accounts table, you have a post AP batches task under the activities menu. In receivables, you have a post AR batches task and so forth. So check those screens first to see if you have any pending batches that need to be posted through. Once you've got those batches either posted or deleted, then you would want to go into each module's maintenance folder and then go into the module setup folder and then into the setup options task in that folder. For each module, you have a data retention tab that outlines how long you would retain data if you were to run a purge. Um, I think most of the native 500 tasks default to 24 months out of the box for some reason, but I think we change most clients to be at least uh, 96 months, uh, which would be eight years worth of data uh, or longer. Uh, but just verify if you are going to do a purge, verify what those data retention, sab, excuse me, data retention tab settings are. And you also have the option for retaining data in, uh, excuse me, uh, retaining data for additions, for changes, deletions, or uh, log retention separate from those changes. So just beware of what you're going to purge, what, what time frame of data you're set to purge if you do run that purge process. Once all of your year-end data has been entered, but before you actually perform a purge, we highly recommend that you do a backup of your SQL database. If you yourself are not familiar with how to do that, then feel free to reach out to your IT folks or reach out to RKL, and we can take care of that for you. But just squirrel away a copy of the database before you run into any purge process so that if for some reason anything were to go wrong or if you wind up purging more data than you want, if we recognize that immediately, we can restore back to that backup in order and get you back to where you were prior to the purge process. If transactions have happened in between, that, then obviously we wouldn't be able to recapture those. As you're going through uh, the purging process, keep in mind the natural order of a month end close and, and perform the purges in that same order if you do decide to do them. So inventory module followed by accounts payable, which also closes PO, followed by accounts receivable, which also closes sales order, then cash management, then multi-currency, and then general ledger last. There are a few things that are safe to purge within 500. Uh, within a few of the uh, purchase order, sales order, and work order uh, tasks, there are options to purge specific items, uh, not just a general history purge. So within the purchase order module, for example, you do have the ability to purchase, uh, excuse me, purge expired purchase orders, uh, receipts of goods or returns of goods, and requisitions if you're using that. In the sales order module, likewise, you've got the ability to purge expired sales orders, quotes, shipments, returns, or RMAs. And in the work order module, you can also tackle completed work orders. There is, in addition to all of those, in the system manager folder, there is an activity log that's maintained by the system, and that activity log tracks things like when period and processing was run, when a purge was run, uh, when security changes may have been made to a security group or users added, um, and postings to the suspense account. So there is a separate task to purge that activity log as well in system manager. 
this might also be a good time to consider going through the list of users that you have in 500 and deleting any folks who may have left during the course of the year so that their accounts are set as uh, inactive. And if you flag the user as deleted in 500, just be aware that there's actually a separate step that needs to happen to make them truly uh, inactive, and that is to either delete or revoke their security directly in SQL as well. So there's a SQL database component as well as the 500 application component to uh, the user status. You may also consider deleting demo companies that may have been installed when your system was first deployed. Um, the SOA company or the COA company as well as a handful of others uh, can be installed to give users the ability to kind of hunt and peck with generic data. Uh, helpful when you're first starting up a system, but more of a nuisance um, as time goes on. So if you are interested in getting rid of those companies that are uh, not related to your specific activity, then feel free to reach out to RKL and we can walk you through the process of deleting those demo data companies. There are also a few tables that you might want to consider uh, pruning down to size. Um, there's a table called the TCI DB activity log, which captures uh, changes that have been made to tables outside of the normal 500 tasks. So um, you may have some transactions flowing through that table that are from either third-party software or uh, corrections that may have been made through a SAGE data fix and so forth. Um, typically not the kind of data that you're going to report on, um, but a table that can get fairly bloated over time, so it's something to consider. Um, there's also another table for the pick lists, and once a shipment has been committed, um, there's rarely a need to go back to the records in that pick list table, so you may also want to consider pruning the TSO pick list. These are, uh, these, pruning these SQL tables is obviously something that you don't want to uh, take lightly, want to make sure that you're leaning on a SQL database administrator or an RKL technician to help you with that process. A few other things to consider as you close out the year. There is a function in General Ledger for uh, tracking budgets, and there is an option in Setup GL Options for what you want to do with your budget data when you do your year-end close you have the option to uh, automatically copy budgets at year end, and you want to take a look at one of the, uh, what the options are for that so that when you do your year end process, you ensure that you have the proper data flowing into your budget going forward. You can manually edit your budgets also in the maintain budgets task. Um, you can use that task to manually copy budgets or update one budget from another. So if you have, a, let's say, current budget, which ships with the software out of the box, and then maybe a separate revised budget or approved budget, um, you can copy data from one budget to the other, and you can do that exclusively for any one account at a time or for any one period at a time. There's also the revise budgets task, which allows you to take the same process a step further by doing multiple general ledger accounts, a range of accounts um, all at once rather than dealing with a specific account or a specific period at a time. And if you do use the revised budgets task, there is a register post process that you have to go through so that you can see the before and after um, as opposed to that maintain budgets task where as soon as you save the change, it's, it's locked in. There's no posting process in that maintain budgets step. You might also want to take a look at your inventory replenishment defaults. So what method of replenishment are you using? Are you using EOQ or min-max? Uh, if you are, do you need to maybe recalculate those min-max values or make changes to the EOQ? There's also half a dozen formulas that you can use for safety stock and so forth. So you may want to take a look at those formulas and see if those might need to be uh, adjusted based on changes in your business throughout the year. This is also a great time for you to review the uh, purchase order vendor performance report. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, uh, every time you do a receipt of goods through the purchase order module or a receipt of invoice through the purchase order module, you have the ability to track things relating to that individual transaction 
um, down to the line item level for things like, you know, damaged shipping, arrived late, um, arrived outside of business hours or exceptional service by the vendor. You can track those sorts of things as you're entering your receipts of goods and your receipts of invoice. And then at the end of the year, you can generate this PO vendor performance report and then sit down with your vendor and, and maybe use that as a negotiating tool so that if you've got a, a contract coming up for renewal, you can say, hey, you know, we noticed that, you know, 37% of the time this past year you've been late on delivery. Maybe we need to get a little break on price if we're going to continue to use you, for example. We'd also encourage you folks who are uh, using manufacturing to review your manufacturing costs including your overhead rates and variances, and uh, review your bond cost roll-up journal so that you can update those standard costs for your items as need be. So that covers the types of things we would normally handle with closing out the old year. We've got a few things we'd want to have you look at to tackle the setting up of the new year. So first thing you'd want to do, if you have not already, is to create the new general ledger fiscal year. And you do that by going into the General Ledger Modules Maintenance folder, open up the GL Setup Task uh, folder, and then inside that, Set Up Fiscal Calendar is the name of the task. And you can simply click on the Fiscal Year drop-down field in that task to see what years have already been defined. If you've already got 2017 defined, you're good to go. If not, you can add as many years forward as you need to. So if you want to go in now and add 2017, 2018, 2019, feel free to do so. Um, once you do, you would do so by clicking the Add Year button and then selecting the year that you want to be created. You'll get a message indicating that beginning balances will be created for that year, and it'll also go through a recalculation of uh, historical balances at that same time. So it may take a minute or two for it to run through that process, depending on how many years of data you may have in 500. Once you um, have that screen up in front of you and have clicked on that Add Year button, it's going to uh, use your prior year typically as a template. So if you're on a calendar year, it'll, it'll use the first of the month for every start date for each period and the last day of the month for the end date. So you just want to make sure that you confirm that those start and end dates are correct before you tell it to go ahead and calculate that uh, fiscal year to create that fiscal year. <clears throat> if you're on a newer version of 500, you'll also see in that same screen uh, several fields that allow you to lock down individual modules or lock unlock all modules for each period. So you'll have the ability to prevent users from posting to those uh, modules for those periods if you select the checkbox to lock that particular module for that particular period. If you're using the inventory module, then you'll also want to make sure that you've got an inventory calendar set up for the year as well. Um, and again, I don't think I mentioned this on the previous slide, but um, anytime you're going through the process of creating a new fiscal year or creating a new inventory year, um, just as I mentioned, when you are going to run a purge, it's a good idea to have a backup taken beforehand, um, probably more so with the inventory calendar than necessarily with the GL calendar, uh, just because the inventory calendar is going to go through a recalc of its inventory transactions, which has typically got more volume in it than your general ledger calendar, uh, a general ledger transaction table might. Um, so it's just a, a safe practice to grab a backup before you go through any of these recalculation steps. Also, if you do have uh, a large volume of items and transactions in inventory, this can take some time to recalculate. It's, it's not unheard of for this to take you know, several minutes at a, medium, at a minimum. Um, so be, uh, be aware that you, this might be a process that you might want to kick off, you know, late on a Friday uh, just to be safe. If you've run it before, you can kind of gauge how long it might take. Um, I've got some clients who have you know, hundreds of warehouses and, and thousands or millions of items, and they kick it off on Friday and then wait to get back in the office on Monday for it to have finished. That's the exception for sure, uh, but just know that it can take some time. And that option, uh, similar to the way the inventory, uh, excuse me, similar to the way the general ledger task is, is located under the inventory management maintenance folder in the inventory setup subfolder, and then setup IM options. There's a button inside the setup IM options 
task as opposed to GL, which has its own unique create fiscal period calendar. Um, this setup inventory calendar is actually a button within the setup IM options task. So if you go over to the miscellaneous tab within setup IM options, which I think is the tab all the way over on the right hand side, uh, you'll see an inventory calendar button on that screen and you'd want to click that button to launch the task to create the new inventory calendar. As I mentioned in the GL calendar, you want to make sure that you confirm the end date for each period. And there's also a work days field for each period, which is used by the replenishment uh, demand and safety stock formulas. So it, uh, you, you want to make sure that those number of work days is accurate in order for the system to come up with valid calculations. So review your uh, number of work days. If you're, you know, if you're working 24 seven, then obviously change that to the number of days in the month. If you folks don't work weekends, then deduct the number of weekend days from the month to arrive at your number of work days. For those folks who are using the uh, SAGE fixed assets, SAGE premier depreciation, uh, if you have FAS integrated with SAGE 500, then you'll want to make sure what the most current version of FAS is that's supported by your version of 500. You can verify whether or not your SAGE 500 is integrated with fixed assets by going to the accounts payable modules maintenance folder, opening up the AP setup subfolder, and then going into setup AP options. In that task, there's an integration tab and you'll see a reference to fixed asset accounting. If that box is checked, you'll also see underneath that box uh, the name of the database and the company in FAS that are associated with the currently selected company in 500. So if you see those fields populated and you see that that fixed asset accounting box is checked, then you know that you are integrating SAGE 500 with SAGE FAS and therefore you have to know which version is supported by your version of 500. If you're running SAGE FAS depreciation standalone from 500, then by all means just go out and grab the latest and greatest version so that you make sure that you have the most current tax rules applicable. And version 2017, if SAGE has not yet released it, um, should be releasing it very soon. Next topic I wanted to touch on would be updating user security groups. So I may have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Alon, if you've got folks who may have left during the course of the year or maybe have folks who have changed responsibility throughout the year, this is a great time for you to go through and identify uh, changes either within security groups that need to be modified um, or different security groups that need to be assigned to specific users or remote excuse me, revoked from specific users. You'll also want to make sure that you have all of the relevant uh, tasks available on your menu. Uh, there is a menu upgrade utility which will allow you to copy tasks from the standard menu that ships with 500 into whatever customized menu or personalized menu your company might be using. Uh, that standard menu has every single module and every single task available within the 500 software, you may not be licensed for all of those modules. So obviously you don't want to bother to copy over tasks or modules um, for modules that you are not licensed for. But for those modules for which you are licensed, you wanna make sure that you have all available tasks included in your menu. So I've listed the typical location for where that menu upgrade utility is. Um, when you tr go ahead and launch that menu upgrade utility, it will validate your 500 credentials. So whether you're using Windows authentication or whether you're using uh, SQL authentication, which requires you to enter a username and a password when you connect into 500, it will do that validation to make sure that you are a valid 500 user and have rights to this particular task before it'll allow you to launch it. And again, um, you want to make sure that when you're reviewing the security groups that you keep in mind the 500 uh, permissions are inclusive. So if you've got a user who's assigned to multiple security groups 
if a task has permission granted in one of those groups, even if it's denied in the other group or groups that may be assigned to that user, that user will get the highest available level of permission. So if you've got a user who has uh, a particular task excluded in one group but is set to either display only, normal, or supervisory in a second group, that user will get display only, normal, or supervisory permission for that task. And again, you might want to review the security groups for individual permissions and tasks that the user can perform within that group. So that's all that I had planned to cover today. At this point, we'll go ahead and check with Walt and see if there are any questions that have come in or see if you want to open up the lines for the Q&A process. Great. Thanks, Doug. We did have two questions that came in via the online chat, so we'll go ahead and address those before I unmute all lines. Uh, question number one, and I believe you did talk about this, is Atrix compatible with all versions of Sage 500? Yeah, so the December update that Sage is going to release, which is going to be the standalone update, will support versions 2013 and higher for Sage 500. When Sage publishes the product update, which will come out sometime in January, which will include other fixes as well, that will only uh, be supported for versions 2014 and 2016. So it's typical for Sage to uh, make these new functions available for only the supported versions, and they typically support the current and two prior versions. So 2016, 2014, 2013 would be currently supported versions of 500. And I'm not sure uh, what the reasoning was behind not including the product update for the 2013 version, uh, but if you are on Sage 2013, you would not be able to use the product update coming out in January for Atrix. Yep, yep, fair enough. And the second question, I'm going to expand a little bit. It had to do with the SQL backup that you talked about before completing the purge. The question was about the cost, you know, our time estimate, and how to schedule that. Okay. So fortunately, um, SQL backups can be taken while users are in the database, and it's a relatively quick and painless procedure. Um, your IT folks may have a policy where they don't want those backups to happen while users are in the system, and that's fine. Um, but it's usually something that we can schedule, and it you know, may only take a few minutes to as much as an hour, depending on if we need to move files across the network. Um, so if that's something that you want to uh, reach out to uh, any of the RKL solution consultants um, or to myself, you know, we can certainly schedule a, a time to work with you on that, either show you how to do it or, or do it for you, but it's a, it's a fairly quick and easy process. Perfect. Uh, before I open up the lines, I just wanted to point out, in addition to our consulting team and our help desk team, everybody has assigned account managers. And if you look at the screen, uh, Gia Lane is our account manager for everything east of the Mississippi, and Mike Sher is your account manager for all accounts west of the Mississippi. If you have any questions or concerns or you don't know these individuals, uh, feel free to write down their contact information. They are a great resource uh, for your, you know, internal navigation and your and your one point of contact here at RKL. Uh, neither Gia or Mike are technical, and they wouldn't be solving uh, your support cases or your consulting questions. But they would help you navigate your licensing, your support cases, uh, open statements of works that you have, uh, being that one you know, customer advocate for you and your, uh, your Sage solution. With that, I'm going to go ahead and unmute all lines. Again, right now, all lines are unmuted. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask Doug or myself. Okay. Anybody have any questions for us? Yeah, I have a question, please. Sure. On the, the 1099 uh, where you talked about the explore option that may not have all the data we needed, how do we acquire that or is there a fee associated with upgrade? I'm assuming that's an upgrade. 
so it's not an upgrade. Um, it, what we would do is we would create a custom SQL view, which is what's uh, under the hood, if you will, for the Business Insights Explore tasks. Mm -hmm. So we, we have uh, sort of a, a template that we've used in prior years. Um, if you want, we can certainly work up a, a quote for you to, to put that in place. And as I think I mentioned, it offers the last three years' worth of history. Um, I'd have to go back and, and check to see what the level of effort is on that to, to provide a quote, yeah, but I, we can certainly main, circle back with you on that. The main reason I'm kind of asking is that I'm trying to find a good, clean way to pull data to do a 10 match prior mm -hmm. to running 1099s. And it seems like everywhere I pull, it doesn't pull all the data neat and clean like, that I need, basically. Yeah, that, that was kind of the driving force behind us creating these views because we, we realized that there was kind of a gap there. So the views that we have will give you all the information that you need relating to the 1099s in one spot. Okay. Is there right. specific verbiage? Is there specific verbiage regarding that view that will trigger your group to know what we're talking about? I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, like, is there a specific thing that we should call it? Do we just call it the 1099 view if that's... Yeah, that uh, 1099 view is just to. fine. Okay. Yep, sorry. Yep. 1099 view is perfect. Okay. Thank you. Sure thing. Anyone else have any other questions? Yeah. Okay. If you do, if you have further questions or when you're replaying the webinar, if you think of something, don't hesitate to send uh, those questions to Gia, Mike, Doug, or support at RKL eSolutions, and we'll make sure that we help you. On behalf of Doug, myself, and the entire team here at RKL eSolutions, want to wish everybody a happy holidays and a prosperous new year. Enjoy some time with your friends and your family, and stay warm. Thank you for attending today, and we'll talk soon. Thanks, Doug.